Good day, everyone, and welcome to our weekly Bible study. I trust that you're having a, a blessed day. Uh, today, I'm doing uh, the Bible study from Florida. Had to come down here for family reasons, and so I'm enjoying the the balmy floral weather. It's you know it's already humidity is already starting to kick in. Although this morning was beautiful, um, but again, wherever you're at, I trust that you are doing doing well. Well, today we're starting a new study. And uh, I, I'm excited about it. Uh, we're probably going to spend two to three months at a minimum on this study because I think there's so many incredible people that I want us to learn from, from the Bible. In particular, we're looking at women of the Bible. And many of them struggled. Many of them will teach us valuable lessons, but they all have a part to play in what God uh, was doing in his, with his people as well as what God was doing in the lives of the people themselves. And so we're going to begin our study and just pray God's blessing. So let's begin with a word of prayer as we begin today. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the blessings of life. Ask, Lord, that you take these next few moments and speak to our hearts as we spend time in your word. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the first one we're going to look at, obviously, is the very first one in the Bible, in the book of Eve. And I think we're going to find this study interesting. Uh, again, most of us who grew up in the church, we know the story quite well. But I think there's still things that we can draw from it and learn and apply in our lives. But for those who may not be that familiar with it, uh, it's found in the book of the beginnings. That's what the book of Genesis means. It's the book of the beginnings. And the story, most of the story that we have about Eve is found in the very first, actually, three chapters. Um, and as you go back and look at creation, the world was empty. And then God began to speak into existence the environment that was going to eventually house people like Adam and Eve. And so he created light and water and land. And then he began to fill it with birds, fish, and land animals. It's interesting that as science looks at the progression from their point of view of how things develop, it perfectly aligns with what God's word has to say. Obviously, there's lots of differences of opinion about how long it took and when did it happen. And again, since none of us were there, we kind of hold to those ideas lightly. But the point is, is that God created an environment for his ultimate creation, people, to live in. And of course, he began by forming Adam. Now, I put that in italics because that's what the scripture says. He formed Adam. All other aspects of the creation was spoken into existence. But when he came to the humans, he formed them. He shaped them. You get this idea, and Paul talks about this, that we are God's workmanship. They're God's in the process of forming us. And of course, we're not being formed into a physical entity. We're being formed into the nature and Christ-likeness that needs to take place in our lives as we follow him and as we look to him. Now, imagine this place that was created. It was, it's called the Garden of Eden. It's, it's literally paradise. Cool, clear water. No air pollution. Everything's fresh. The creation was ideal that God spoke into existence. And then after he creates Adam, forms Adam, he says, it's not good for the man, Adam, to be alone. And I will make a helper who is the perfect match for him, just right for him. Now, the word helper in the Hebrew, unfortunately, our translations doesn't really help us on what this means. We, we get the idea, and I've actually heard people say, well, he just hired you know, someone to clean the house and cook the meals. That's not what this helper means. It literally should be translated partner. In other words, God was looking for something that would be Adam's match. The word actually implies the, the same thing, but opposite. So it's of the same essence. It's It, it has the same uh, value as, as the male portion of the creation. It's just a complementary or opposite. It's an equal entity, Evis. So she's unique, but she's equal. 
And that's important because, you know, as we read through the Bible, we're going to find out that it's much of the Old Testament in particular, but even in the New Testament, very matriarchal, very male-oriented. But that was not God's original design. What God made is he made two people that different, yes, you know, physically different, probably had emotional personalities. They were different, but they were equal in essence, okay? And what it says, he, she was just right. She, she was the perfect match for Adam. Now, it's interesting that when God said he, it's not good for man to be alone, when we look at it before, it's is that he, Adam was in his Eden. He was looking at the animals. And again, this sounds strange to us, but we're looking back. But he didn't know what his match was. He didn't know what the, that person that would compliment him the most. And it became clear that there was a disconnect between all the rest of creation and who he was. And so God um, created this incredible woman, woman okay, that we call Eve. Okay. So even though the Bible is written for most of the Bible from a matriarchal point of view, what God is saying to us, that was not his original intent. God's original intent, his original design was for total equality between the man and the woman. And we see this with Eve. Story goes on. So God created these male and female, and he created them in his own image. We'll come back to that in just a moment. And then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. In other words, they're going to have kids. They're going to have lots of offspring. Okay? And they're going to fill the earth. And they're going to govern it. They're going to steward it. They're going to rule over it, reign over it. Okay, Not to abuse it, but to manage it. That's really what it means when it talks about governing and reigning is that humans are to steward. They are to take care of this creation. And so they are to reign over the fish, the birds, and the animals that scurry along the ground. So let's take a look at what these two verses tell us about Eve. Eve was created in the image of God, just like Adam. It wasn't that Adam was created in the image of God and that Eve is some inferior entity. Nowhere in the biblical record is that true. Now, what does it mean that Eve was created in the image of God? Well, there's I could probably spend a whole lesson just on that, but just the short version is that the humans were able to communicate with the creator in a way the rest of creation could not. That Adam and Eve were had the ability to make choices. Now, some people would say that would be free will, and they had free will. They were told what the rules were, and they had a choice whether they were going to follow the rules or not follow the rule. So they had the ability to make choices. God makes choices. He chooses to love us. He chooses to forgive us. Those are choices. He's not obligated to do those things. We are like our creator, God, in the fact that we can make choices and that we are to take care of something, just like God through the Old Testament took care of his people, and then we move into the New Testament, and we see that God is still taking care of his people uh, in a variety of different ways. So Adam and Eve were like their creator, God, and that they were to tend the, the, the garden, tend, take care of Eden. So notice that Eve's job description she doesn't have a different job description. Her job wasn't to cook. Her job wasn't to have the kids and raise the kids. She had the exact same job description. That was to take care of, govern, reign, steward the garden. Now, this is an interesting one because in our environment today, we have people who say, wow, what that means is we should never change the environment. That's not what this is saying. We are not to be park rangers. Park rangers don't change. They just try to keep everything as is. That's not what Adam and Eve were to do. They were to be gardeners, which literally means they were to make something out of it. So 
that they could use their creative powers to say, hey, listen, let's let's plant some trees over here. That would look nice if we put some flowers. We need a little more color here. Uh, Adam, help me help me move these, the, these, these plants over here. In other words, they were to take the raw material of the creation and make something even better out of it. Okay. We are to work out. We are to work it. Work, work the field, just like a farmer works the, the field. Uh, he makes something better to create a harvest. So Adam and Eve were to do this. So both Adam and Eve had the same job description as they were in this ideal world. Further, they, she was to partner because it wasn't all on her. They were to partner and become a mother to be fruitful and to multiply. So that was part of them working together. Okay. And then it goes on. The next part says, and this explains, Genesis tells us, why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Now the man and the woman were both naked, but they felt no shame. So again, a couple things to think about from those two verses. Okay. First of all, in a patriarchal society, the woman always left her home and become tied and attached to the man and basically establish a new household. But in God's original creation, notice what it's saying here. He's, not, he's basically undercutting a patriarchal society. He says the man is to leave his father and mother, is to join to his wife and establish a new household. In other words, not be under these uh, subjection of the elders of the community. Um, our, one of our sons, our oldest son lives in China. And on one of my first business trips there a number of years ago, um, got to know a guy, he was probably in his forties. Nice, was, we called him Kevin. And uh, he was telling about the fact that he was thinking about moving from the Northern part of China down to the Southern part, but he couldn't do it without the permission of his parents. That's a patriarchal. As long as the elder is alive, basically everyone, even if they have their own family, was subjected to that. That's not a biblical model. When Adam and Eve were joined together, basically they were establishing a household. And, and so the writer, this is being pulled together, these, these, these stories of creation by Moses many years later was saying God's original intent was that a new household would be established. Yes, we still want connections with aunts and uncles and parents and in-laws, but the fact is it's a new household. And so, again, Adam was to leave his father and mother and be joined, okay, and focus on Eve, not on his father and not on his parents. Very, very different in God's original design the second thing is that they both were naked okay you know that that's odd to us uh, the idea of going naked you know we, we, we kind of hide because obviously we're living on this side of the disobedience that adam and eve are going to do here and we're going to look at in just a few moments but originally Adam and Eve lived in perfect harmony. There were no walls between the two of them. There was no shame, total innocence, complete transparency. They didn't feel like they had to hide, have agendas. It was the perfect, perfect marriage. And the Hebrew just kind of sums that up by saying they both were naked, but it's more than just the physical nakedness there's a total vulnerability that's taking place between the man and the woman but one day don't know how long months maybe years she's walking through eve's walking through the garden and she hears the voice coming from the snake now when i put a note here that just means that these are some thoughts i have as i'm reading scripture notice that eve is not startled which you would say, I mean, if I saw a snake, I'm kind of like Indiana Jones. I hate snakes, right? A couple of times he says that in, in his movies, right? But Eve, 
not startled. Was this a common occurrence for her to see snake? Was it a common occurrence for snakes to talk? Interesting question. Don't know the answer. It's hard to argue in silence, so I, we don't push this, but some things to think about. So she hears this voice. And of course, we know who the serpent is. Genesis doesn't tell us who the serpent is, who's, who's, who's speaking through. We're told from other parts of scripture that Satan basically had come into the serpent and was using the serpent to speak to. So the serpent by is, is not devilish, even though you may hate snakes. Uh, but the point is, is that this snake obviously was a very unique snake. Okay. And, um, and, and of course, he wanted God, the position of God. He wanted to be in charge, we know from the rest of scripture. And so he's beginning to sabotage God's creative work on this planet. Now, what does a serpent do? First of all, he challenges what Eve had been told by her husband. Okay. And he gives an actual bold lie out there. You say, I'll say it now here. What do you mean told by her husband? From the story, which I didn't give in some detail, Adam was told what he couldn't eat in the garden. Again, we'll come to that in a little more detail. But he was told Eve wasn't created yet when that takes place. So, again, it appears from the story that Adam is told what he can do with basically the rules of being in the garden. It was upon Adam to tell Eve. Okay, so did Eve not get it right? Did Adam not do a good job in explaining what the, the rules were? Don't know. Don't know. All we know is she is aware of something because of the dialogue that's about ready to take place. First of all, a serpent does a bold lie. Did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? What I've underlined is the bold lie. That was not what God said. God said they could eat of any tree that bore fruit in the garden, except for just one. So the first thing we learn is that Satan is a liar. And when he whispers things in our ear and says, you know, you're no good, they don't like you, just realize that if it's not positive, it's more likely the Satan just playing head games with us. And we need to reject that and not live with that, those thoughts. Okay, so I guess it was in this next bullet. So when God created, he had told him that you could eat except one. So the story assumes that Adam had told his wife what the arrangement was. Eat anything except for one. And basically says you're to take care of the paradise. But there was one rule, Adam. Don't eat from this tree. Now, what does Eve say back to the serpent? Well, she gives a partial truth and she adds something. Okay, now, was it that she didn't hear Adam right? What was going on? Was she kind of making this up as she's going along? We don't know, but we know that this is going to create a problem as a story unfolds. Of course, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. Okay, she got that right. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat now. Don't know whether the tree was in the middle or not. So we'll just assume that she got that right. Here's where she messes up. But you must not eat it, God said, or even touch it. That's the addition. Okay. So did Eve not get the story right? Where she kind of ad living as she's having this dialogue. And that if you do, you will die. You will die. So let me pause there before we continue the story. Be careful when we are using scripture. I've heard people use scripture in a way that I just, it's mind boggling to me because it is so far removed from God's original intention. The scripture doesn't say that, okay? And I, I'm giving you two examples here. During the Civil War era, leading up to the Civil War, during that period of, of our history that's, not very positive at all, okay? 
Christians, many Christians, not all Christians, many Christians use the story of Noah cursing his grandson as a reason why it was all right to have the descendants of Ham enslaved. Now, for those who don't know the story, Ham is the son who did something. Canaan is the grandson. Okay. Here's the problem. Most of Ham's descendants ended up in North Africa. And so people say, ah, so it's, you know, it's the, the Negroid race. It's, it's the black people. And God says they're cursed and they're going to be servants. But Ham wasn't cursed. It was his grandson, Canaan, who was not in Africa. He was in, they were the Canaanites. They were the people in the promised land when Israel came in. They, you know, they were, they were tied from Ham, but they were different, so different. But when people have an agenda, they will look for whatever excuse to justify. Please don't let us be caught up with that, having scripture. Another one is I heard people say, third John, uh, may you be blessed even as your soul bless. You know, and they'd use that to justify why we should be rich. That's just a greeting of the day. It's a, it's a Hebrew idiom, okay? Obviously, it's written in the Greek, but it's what the people would say. It's like shalom, okay? So we need to be careful that we don't have scripture saying something. Eve gets herself in trouble because in her case, she adds to scripture. And she puts in God's mouth something he never said. The other example I give is the Hebrew word yom, which is translated day. And it can be day or it could be nonspecific. The Hebrew does not require it to be a 24-hour day. It could be a whole eon. It could be a whole era. And, and, and so as we study creation, we, we talk with our students at the university that I teach at that let Scripture speak, but don't put words in Scripture's mouth to say what you want it to say. Don't be a casual reader. Be a student of Scripture. Ask questions. Uh, Let's move on with our back to the story. Say serpent now is getting real bold. You won't die. Okay. Which is a bold lie. Okay. And the serpent replied, God, God knows that your eyes will be open as soon as you eat and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. And the woman was convinced. In other words, he had talked her into a, this is all right. Maybe I didn't hear Adam right. And so we don't know the mental gymnastics she was going through to justify what she's about ready to go do, go through. Now, before we get into what she actually did, let's look at the progression of Eve's actions. It says in the scripture, she saw that the tree was beautiful. Okay. So she looked, you know, the, the eyes are the, the gate into our minds. Okay. And so she saw, you know, when people see and they see things they shouldn't see, uh, it, it has an impact on their life. So she first thing she did, she, she saw it looked delicious. And she was desiring to want the wisdom it would give her. She had no idea what good and evil were all about because she had lived in good. God's creation was good and very good. So she takes it because of this progression, and she eats it. Now, note something. Seeing and touching were not the problem. She starts down the path when she eats it. But the seeing and touching is where she got in trouble. She should have been as far as she could be from that tree. So who knows? Maybe she went by every day before she made the decision to eat. And she said, wow, that really looks good. Boy, that, that I, I'm hungry today. Okay. And she just dabbled. You run. You don't see how close you can get to destruction. You run as far as you can. I remember as a youth pastor, I would have uh, kids come up to me and say, you know, pastor, if we did this, uh, would, could we, would we still be able to go to heaven or go to be with God? And I say, why are you worried about how close you can be away from God 
and still go to God? Why, why don't you just focus on what you can do to become draw yourself closer to God and remove yourself from all of those temptations that you know have the potential to lead you down paths that you know you shouldn't go? Well, Eve didn't learn that lesson. So what did she do? Well, before we do that, the New Testament gives its progression of what Eve did. John tells us in verse John chapter 2, for everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the seeing, the pride of light. She wanted the wisdom. They don't come from the Father, but they come from the world system. They come from the world system. So she goes, she takes, and she gives to her husband. Chapter 3 tells us, verses 6 and 7, who was with her, and he ate it too. And at that moment, their eyes were open, and they suddenly, something changed. They felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. So we see her influence she gave to Adam. What's Adam going to do? Did Adam see her actually take it off the tree? Or was Adam just walking by as she has taken it off, and he suspects because it might have been a, a unique fruit that none of the other trees had in the garden, um, where it came from, what's he going to do? Because he remembers something's going to change, and it's going to break up this perfect marriage. Is that what made him decide to go and join her so that he wouldn't be alone again? Yeah, don't know. And something to think about and reflect on. But notice the results when they eat. Things got awkward. And they tried to fix it. All of a sudden, that which seemed so normal and natural felt weird. And so they created a temporary fix as they patched some fig leaves together to cover themselves. Some thoughts to consider. We know that when we are tempted, that Satan uses bait. James talks about this. We talked about it several weeks ago, in fact, in our study in the book of James, that Satan uses bait that appeals to something within us. Okay, If Eve didn't care about wisdom, probably this wouldn't have been an issue. There are things that I, I can see that don't bother me. Another brother or sister in Christ is exposed to it, and it creates a serious problem. Satan knows, you know, our vulnerabilities here, okay? And is, is it possible that Eve saw the tree and thought, why was that tree selected? What's so special about that tree? It looks so good. Maybe Adam and Eve had discussed this in the past, and they agreed that to avoid the problem, they won't even touch it. Maybe that's where the idea came from is we, we won't even go down that path. Okay. All we know is she became susceptible. Then, of course, Satan lies. It won't happen to you. Isn't that the lie that Satan gives? Think back to your, when you were a younger person and, and you were dabbling in things that you knew that were not healthy and, and they were destructive in your life. And what was the old thought? Well, yeah, I know it happened to them, but it won't happen to me. You know, yeah, I hear this all the time about people who become alcoholics, and they always said, "You know what? I I can I can hold my beer. It, it, you know, I can I can handle the drugs. Okay, I, it won't put me over the edge. You know, the athlete who thinks that they they can whip the world, or the musician that can whip the world, it won't happen to me. Okay, that's what he was thinking. That was the lie that at least Satan was given to her." Did she even understand what dying means? Probably in the animal kingdom, there's nothing that indicates that the animals didn't die. Okay, so she knew something, but obviously there was no human experience related to it. But, but at anything, anyway, at this point, she should have run. She had a choice. God had given her that ability, but she continued the discussion. Okay. Not only won't you die, but you will be like God. And what was Satan doing? Satan was appealing to her to be independent from the creator, which is going to lead to disobedience. When you and I 
want to live life the way we want to live life, it always creates difficulties in our lives. God is the creator. He knows what is in our best interest. That's why there are rules, because he knows what's in our best interest. He doesn't want to be a killjoy. He wants us to enjoy life. Okay, But we have to do it God's way. And Satan, that, that was the trap that he gives to all of us. Hey, just ignore what God's word has to say. Ignore what, what you know the Bible tells us and just do your thing. So at the act of disobedience, Eve noticed that her relationship with her husband had changed. Where they had always been at ease, now all of a sudden they're very shy. Her innocence was gone. She was not free and easy in her relationship with Adam. And she began to hide because now she discovered that she was naked. Later, either that day or likely that day, in the cool of the evening, the man and the woman, Adam and Eve, heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. And so what happened? They hid. They knew something was different. There was awareness inside. No one had to tell them this. They just became aware. When sin entered the picture, it changed all of the relationships, not only between Adam and Eve and that awkwardness, but now between their creator and God. And so they're hiding. And God says to the man, where are you? And Adam replies, well, I heard you walking in the garden. So I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Okay. Didn't want God to see him without clothes. Even though they had no concept of what clothes, their makeshift clothes, right? So they, they hide. So instead of becoming like God, what Eve learns real fast is she's now afraid of God, okay? And she flees and she hides. Now, notice that God didn't accuse her, but he asked her, what, what, what happened here? What, what's going on? Was God giving Adam and Eve a chance to acknowledge their disobedience? Because he doesn't come in, you know, and basically said, because he knew what had taken place, I'm sure. But he's going and having his his encounter with Adam, and all of a sudden, it, the consequences of that disobedience is already playing in. And so God says, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? And Adam replied, it was the woman you gave me who gave me the fruit, and I ate it. And then the Lord God asked the woman, what have you done? And the serpent deceived me, she replied. That's why I ate it. Now, interesting, God directs his comments to Adam. Why? Because God had given the instruction to Adam, and Adam was responsible to give the instructions to Eve, okay? Because Eve hadn't been present when the, the rule had been put in place, okay? So, in fact, Adam now joins in. He's culpable even at a greater level because he had heard directly from God, and he now participates in the same act of disobedience. And, of course, we see the classic finger pointing. He made me do it. She made me do it. Satan made me do it. Everyone wants to point fingers at someone else. No one wants to take responsibility. Eve learns real fast that there are consequences. She learns that the entire creation is cursed. The soil is now going to produce weeds. Could you imagine creation where there were no weeds? Oh, my goodness. When I was gardening... And we had a little family garden that, you know, we planted some tomatoes and some green beans and some radishes. And my job was to, to pull the weeds. And I, I mean, you had to do it regularly or the weeds would overtake the garden. Okay. All of a sudden now we got to deal with weeds. The tranquil tranquility of the animal kingdom is gone. And then God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all animals domestic and wild, and you will crawl on your belly, groveling in the dust as long as you live. And I will cause hostility between you and the woman, and really, literally, between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head, but the offspring of the woman, he, you will strike the heel of the offspring of the woman, but the offspring that the Eve brings into the world will crush your head will strike your head. Okay. So 
couple things from these verses. We see the first messianic prophecy that somewhere in the future, there's going to be one of the descendants of Eve. This is the prop. This is to her. The promise is that you're going to have a descendant that is going to take care of, in this case, Satan. Okay. The serpent, he's going to crawl, crawl. Satan is going to be taken care of. That day, you know, happened in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was. We'll see the fulfillment in Jesus, what Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross. We'll see the fulfillment with the new heavens and the new earth at the end of time. So many years have obviously passed since then, and many years since Jesus have continued, 2,000 years. We don't know how much longer it's going to take place. But the promise in chapter 3 of the book of Genesis says there's going to be an offspring of the woman that's going to basically right this wrong. Her seed will destroy Satan. Then she go, Satan goes on, excuse me, speaking to Eve, and I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy, and in pain you will give birth. That's the first thing. The second thing, and you will desire to control your husband. But what's going to end up happening, he will rule over you. And we need to spend a little time there because that's a controversial passage that gets quoted elsewhere in the scriptures. So let's look at the consequences for Eve. Number one, she will endure pain, a very sharp pain, in childbirth. Now, think about the fact that there was no one there to help her when her first child was born. Okay, And there was pain. All she had was Adam. And we all know that us guys probably are worthless in most of those most of the time in those situations. So the first thing is there's pain. Okay. Adam, we didn't because this is about Eve. Adam, he had his consequences, but we're just talking about Eve at this point. Number two, she is going to lose her equality with Adam because they are now the man and the woman in the relationship are fighting for control. She wants to control Adam. Adam is going to rule over her. In essence, create what eventually we know as the patriarchal system. So sad because that's not God's original design. The third thing that Eve and Adam ex the, uh, consequence was that death was going to come. It wasn't instant, but they started the death process. They weren't going to live forever. And if you ever see the years, whether those are literal years or they're, they're representative, the fact is the further you remove yourself looking at the genealogies from Adam and Eve, the shorter the lifespan that takes place because the genetic material is getting all messed up because disease now has entered the world. And the fourth is, we know from the story, they are removed from the paradise that God had created for them. So let's wrap this up here. God's solution, this last slide. Now what's going to happen? He gives consequences, God does, to all of the participants, parties in this event that took place. What's God going to do? Well, God takes the initiative. God always takes the initiative. And we see the first act of redemption to combat this disobedience that we call sin. Here's what he did. Chapter 3, verses 21 through 23. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord said, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life which was they were allowed to eat, and they would live forever if they kept eating. And so the Lord God banished them from the garden to work the ground, but outside this lovely garden. To show them, to show Adam and Eve what forgiveness was all about, God sacrificed an innocent lamb. He takes the garments, the skin of the animal, and he makes garments he basically, he's creating a more permanent solution to their temporary solution as they had 
put together, sewn together, you know, using probably vines to kind of cover themselves up. And that's exactly what redemption is, is God is saying, I want you back in relationship. And there is an innocent lamb that was slain for them to cover their sin. The nakedness being an illustration or a type of the sin. That's exactly what Jesus Christ is. He is the ultimate innocent. A person without sin who died on a cross for you and I to be in right relationship with our creator, God. Act of redemption. It was initiated by God. It wasn't something that humans came up with to try to figure out because when we do it, it doesn't work very well. Okay. It's temporary at best. But God says, I love my creation so much that I will create a solution here. The ultimate solution was he came in the form of flesh, being the offspring of a woman, Jesus. And he died on a cross for your sins and mine. Eve, she messed up the relationship. Eve, who had been created co-equal with Adam, now, I want to just put a note here, is that in the New Covenant, we see some of this coming back into play. So, for example, Joel, who gets quoted by Peter on the day of Pentecost, he says that in the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And it talks about what the young men and the old men and the young women and the old women, in other words, God's working in our lives. There's no male or female in God's economy in the new covenant. Okay, he's, uh, he's beginning to unwind this patriarchal concept that existed in, in the ancient world. Even in the, when we get to Corinthians, Paul talks about that our function in the church is not based on gender. It's based on giftedness that God gave all people gifts. He didn't say that gifts for male, that gifts for female. He doesn't make that distinction when Paul talks about the gifts in 1 Corinthians 12 and 14. And Paul talks about in other letters that all people, male and female, are inheritors of God's blessing. So we see in the new covenant in particular this idea. We saw a little bit in the Old Covenant, but we really see it in the New Covenant, this idea of equality coming back into play. But the final and most devastating thing that we learn from Eve is that there are consequences when we obey, but there's also consequences when we disobey. And the fact is, is that you and I today are living in a world that it, it just evil abounds. And it's because people have abandoned the things of God and they've disobeyed. And this all started in motion because what Eve and Adam did there in the garden. So let's close. What do we learn from Eve today? We learned the fact that Eve made some choices, not from very good choices. She had a perfect situation. She had a perfect marriage. Total transparency. Boy, we'd love that in our marriages, those of us who are still married. Okay? You know, but we do, do we really trust them? How much do we trust them? There was none of these types of discussions or thought process with, with Adam and Eve. But because she chose to do something that she was told not to do, we live with the consequences of it. And the lesson for me is there are consequences in the choices I make every day. I will be making many choices today. And I, I'm trusting that the most of my choices will have good outcome, but there's a possibility there. There may be some choices I make that don't have good outcome. So I seek God for wisdom. I seek him for direction because I want to do something that is pleasing to him as I work with my wife, as I work with my father-in-law, with his health issues, and with whoever that I'm working with. And that's my prayer for us, is that we learn this from Eve, is there are consequences, and may we never, never forget that. Father, help us in our choices.
may we learn the lesson that Eve, she had to have been heartbroken as she saw it worked out with her kids when she saw one of her sons kill another son. Maybe she didn't see it directly, but she knew about it and how her heart must have been broken to realize it was because of choice that she had made. May we never forget our choices have impact. Keep us safe until we come back next week. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you all. Have a great, great day.